Okay, well, good morning, everyone. And first, I need you to get your heads out of the tropics and into the Arctic, because we're going to be talking about how the enhanced warming in the Arctic is, I think, affecting extreme weather in mid-latitudes. So let's start by going back to the good old days, when we could look down on the Arctic Ocean from a satellite and see a nice, healthy ice cover sitting on covering most of the Arctic Ocean at the end of the melt season during the summer. This is an example back in 1980. But what we see these days is very, very different. Looking at uh, 2007, for example, and you can visually see that the ice cover at the end of the melt season is about 40% reduced from what it was in those good old days. The difference in the area in the sea ice between these two time periods is about 1.3 million square miles. I mean, that is just huge. And if you want to relate that to something more familiar, it's equivalent to about 40% of the lower 48 states, or for your Europeans, it covers all of Europe. So the, the question is, we've got all this open water now that used to be covered with ice, it used to reflect a lot of solar radiation back to outer space that isn't anymore. All this solar energy from the summer is going right into the Arctic Ocean, warming the Arctic Ocean. What's happening to all that energy? Well, as the cold temperatures move back in in the fall, All of that energy is coming back out of the ocean into the atmosphere in the form of sensible heat, water vapor, or latent heat, and infrared radiation. So the question is really not whether the sea ice loss can be affecting the atmospheric circulation on a large scale. It's how can it not be? And what are the mechanisms? And even more important, what are the impacts? So what I'm going to focus on today, a lot of people have been looking at how sea ice is affecting the atmospheric circulation. I'm going to focus in on particularly how the enhanced warming in the Arctic is potentially affecting extreme weather in the northern hemisphere mid-latitudes. And I want to be very clear about what I mean by extreme weather. The extreme weather I'm talking about is caused by very persistent weather patterns, which tend to be associated with very high amplitude upper level patterns, so high amplitude waves in the jet stream, if you will. And there are some examples that illustrate this very well. For example, if you look at the 20 coldest days in Tampa, you can see that the anomalies in the 500 millibar height field show a very high amplitude pattern with a big ridge over the west and a big trough over the east coast. Similarly, if you look at the hottest days in Atlanta, you see a big ridge parked over the Mississippi Valley or the wettest days in Chicago, a big trough over the, um, over the western Rockies, bringing a lot of moisture up from the Gulf of Mexico right into Chicago. So the point here is a very high amplitude upper level pattern associated with, with this type of extreme weather. All right, so get back to the ice cover and how all this heat is going back into the atmosphere in the fall, and we can see very clearly how it's affecting the atmosphere in the Arctic. So looking down here on the Um, North Pole. We can see Greenland and Siberia. And this is the anomalies in the near surface temperature, um, um, the air at the near surface during the fall, during the last decade. And you can see the anomalies in the temperature, like four to six degrees, really big anomalies. And they're not confined to the surface. If we move up to the 850 millibars now, and I've expanded the view a little bit, a little bigger area, you can see that these anomalies are um, much larger in spatial extent. And if we continue up to 700 millibars, we again see these um, warm temperature anomalies all over the Arctic basin. If we integrate all that and look at the 1,000 to 500 millibar thickness anomalies, again, a big, huge anomaly right over the Arctic. So thinking about how this is going to affect circulation patterns, if you have the uh, 1,000 to 500 millibar thicknesses increasing more at high latitudes, then at mid-latitudes, of course, the poleward thickness gradient then is going to be weakened. And looking, and we also see this happening in the winter as well. It's not um, quite as pan-Arctic, but it's um, still a strong uh, anomaly, mainly focused over the North Atlantic. So we looked at this a few years ago in some work where we looked at um, summers when the sea ice cover was um, lower than normal compared to when sea ice was higher than normal. So on the vertical axis here is um, the polar temperature gradient, the polar thickness gradient, and starting in those summers, looking at how that thickness gradient evolved going into the fall, the winter, and even into the spring. And you can see that during, this is in the North Atlantic now, you can see that during the summers when the ice was lower than normal, that polar thickness gradient was weaker than when the sea ice was extensive. 
and this was true in the North Pacific as well. So what I'm going to do today now is focus on mainly the fall and the winter and thinking about those thickness increases that are larger in high latitudes than in mid-latitudes, I expect there to be two main effects. The first one is we know that the zonal upper-level winds are driven by this poleward thickness gradient. So we'd expect to see weaker zonal winds at upper levels. Do we see this? Yes, we do. Let's look in first at these thicknesses um, by season, looking back over time going back to 1950 to 2010, and I'm looking at the polar thickness gradient here for each season. The brown line here is for fall, and you can see that since about the mid-1980s or so, there's been a very steady decrease in the thickness gradient, both in the fall and in the winter. And this is over the North America, North Atlantic area, but it's true over the whole hemisphere. And together with that, if we look at the zonal mean winds at 500 millibars between 40 and 60 north, we see, again, this big drop or big weakening in the zonal winds during the fall and in the winter. In fact, this weakening is about 20% since about the mid-1980s when the sea ice really started to decrease. So weaker zonal wind speeds, we know through Rossby theory, favors a slower progression of Rossby waves, which leads to more persistent weather patterns or patterns that tend to seem like they're stuck. All right, that was the first effect. Now, the second effect, I want you to think about a particular isopleth in the 500 millibar height field. All right, here's just a schematic example of one over North America. Now, if you've got warming that's larger in the northern part of this region than you do in the south, what you'd expect to see is the ridges to be elongated northward because they're warming more than just the hemispheric wide warming, which you'll see probably some northward progression of the troughs as well, but it should be larger for the ridges. And what does this do? This tends to increase the amplitude of the waves in the upper level flow. And we know that when the waves are higher amplitude, they tend to move more slowly. And this, again, leads to more persistent weather patterns. So we have these two effects that are doing the same thing. All right, let's look a little deeper now, see if this is actually happening. Again, I'm sticking with the 500 millibar height fields, and what I'm going to do is pick a particular narrow range of 500 millibar heights, a single isopleth, if you will, and isolate. This is just an example for a particular day. Um, isolating grid points from the NSEP reanalysis with a narrow range of heights so that we capture just the pattern or the wave pattern in the 500 millibar flow and do this for every day. And then we're going to analyze how these um, patterns change in time and space. Okay, so the first question is, is the wave amplitude really increasing? So the way I got at this was to try to get at a measure of the wave amplitude. So what I did was I took the maximum latitude and the minimum latitude during a season at each longitude as an estimate of the wave amplitude. And I'm plotting these in a Hovmeyer diagram. And this is across the entire northern hemisphere now. So this is longitude on the, on the x-axis and time on the y-axis. It's a very noisy plot, but these red values here are where the wave amplitude is large. So if you actually do the trend analysis for each longitude, which is plotted up on the top here, you can see that the trends are positive everywhere. This, at the red asterisks show you where the trends are significantly, are statistically significant. So you can see that across the entire northern hemisphere, during the fall now, this is when uh, we see that the amplitude seems to be increasing everywhere. During the winter, we see pretty much the same thing. Um, again, the, the trends are positive just about everywhere with peaks in the eastern Eurasian area, peaks over North America, and peaks in the eastern North Atlantic. All right, so we're going to get into this a little more here and focus in now on the North American and North Atlantic region, again, analyzing these uh, selected grid points that represent a single isopleth in the 500 millibar height field and looking at how they're distributed in latitude versus time now. And these are the fractional anomalies in the numbers of these grid points at each latitude. So a value of 1 in this diagram means that it's normal relative to the first 30 years of this record. So what we see here is that north of 50 north, we're seeing an increase in the ridging. That's indicated by these red blobs here. But at the same time, we see a decrease in the trough. So this suggests that either the whole pattern is moving northward or maybe the pattern is increasing in amplitude. 
so again, we're just talking about fall right now, we can get at this a little more by plotting the maximum latitude or the peaks of the ridges, if you will, and how those have evolved in time, which is the top plot here. And we see that since about the mid 80s or so, the maximum latitude of the ridges has increased, so they're moving northward. The minimum latitude hasn't really changed that much since, since the mid-80s, um, mid so the troughs are staying about the same. But if you take the difference between those two, which again is another measure of the wave amplitude, you see that that is also increasing since about the mid-80s. I've also plotted on here the sea ice area for September, and it's in reverse axis, and these correlation coefficients are relative to the sea ice area. So you can see that the ridging and also the latitude difference or the wave amplitude seems to be pretty highly correlated with the sea ice area. Okay, so you, now you might be wondering, well, where are these ridges actually doing their elongating? Because that's really what's going to affect the weather that we sense at the surface. So to get at that, I'm taking just the grid points that are north of 50 north and plotting those in a Hovmeyer diagram to see where these ridges tend to occur and wh whether they're changing in time. So that's what this uh, Hovmeyer is showing you. And it's, again, it's just for this region over North America, North Atlantic. And so what we see is there's a very definite preference for what longitudes the ridges tend to be lining up on. And particularly, they're over the Western North America and over in the Eastern North Atlantic. So again, if we plot the um, trends or calculate the trends in these um, ridges, we see that there are pretty much positive trends everywhere. They're statistically significant just west of Greenland in the fall. So I'm going to do, we're, I'm going to quickly run through this exact same analysis, but for the winter case. And again, here's what I'm calling my fire plots, where we show these, uh, the latitude distribution of these grid points. And once again, north of 40 north, you can see that there's a tendency for increased ridging and again, a, an in, a decrease in the troughing in the low latitudes. And again, this suggests that the wave amplitude is increasing or maybe the whole pattern is moving northward. And we can again look at that by plotting the maximum latitude of the ridges, which again we see is increasing over time. And the troughs are actually moving northward as well. And the latitude difference is again increasing with time. So I've also plotted on here the AO index because you think, well, maybe this is related to the AO. But it turns out that there's a very low correlation between the AO and the ridging um, behavior and also the amplitude behavior, although there is uh, some correlation with the, um, what the troughs are doing moving northward. So where are these ridges happening in the wintertime? Again, we've, I'm showing this uh, Hovmeyer diagram of the longitude of the ridges versus time. And again, the red areas are where the um, the most ridging grid points. They're north of 40 degrees north. And once again, we see there's a very strong preference for where these ridges are tending to set up, mainly over Western North America and the North Atlantic. And the trends now um, are again quite positive and especially over North America in the winter. So you might be thinking snowpack over the Rockies, um, winter warming over the Western um, part of the states. And just a little on the flip side here, I'm actually plotting now the, the points that are south of 40 degrees north, so getting at what's happening with the troughs in the wintertime, because this is, of course, more related to precipitation and snowpack in the winter. And what we see is the troughs are very preferentially lined up along the U.S. East Coast. And as we look at the trends here, these trends are all negative. As we've seen, the troughs are all moving northward. So we either have weaker troughs over the west central U.S., and the eastern North Atlantic, or perhaps there's fewer of them. All right, so just, I have a sort of a diagram to summarize all this. We start with Arctic amplification. This is the enhanced warming that is observed, clearly absorbed over the Arctic. And it's especially in the fall and winter, and I didn't have time to talk about summer, but there's a very similar thing going on in the summer because of the earlier snow melt over high latitude land. And uh, Dave Robinson talked about this on Monday. We see very similar effects uh, in the summer as well. So because of this uh, differential warming in the Arctic, we see that the polar thickness gradient is weakening. And this has two effects. We have a weaker upper, upper level zonal flow, which reduces the phase speed of Rossby waves. We also see that the peaks of the ridges are elongating northward, which increases the amplitude of the upper level waves. And both of these are causing the Rossby waves and the upper level flow to move more slowly eastward. And this is connected with weather at the surface. When you have your waves moving more slowly, 
you tend to have more persistent weather patterns, which we know is connected with extreme weather of certain, certain types. So we'd expect to see an increased probability of these types of extremes, droughts, flooding, hot heat waves, cold spells, prolonged snowfall. And with that, I hope there's a time for a question or two. Haven't considered it, but um, it should be considered. Yeah, this is all brand new work, and there's a lot more to do, clearly. Thanks. Other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you to all our speakers.